Have you ever felt as though you really did something to mess things up and to ruin your usefulness for the Lord? I think somebody like the Apostle Peter felt the same way when he denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. But when you read in the book of John, and specifically in chapter 21, you see the restorative work of Jesus at play, and it's truly an amazing thing. And so what I want to do on this episode of Loving the Scriptures, I want to share with you a sermon that I preached on that uh, whole thing of restoration of Peter um, after he had denied Jesus three, three times and after he had encountered the Lord, uh, the resurrected Lord, and how the Lord reinstates Peter and what co- sort of lessons that we can learn from that experience, from that episode. Okay, so um, I truly hope that the, uh, that this is going to be something that will bless you, especially if you're in a situation where you can uh, kind of identify with some of the things that Peter is going through. Um, and so I hope that this is something that serves as an encouragement to you. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and listen uh, to this sermon. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. I was supposed to preach. Mark had asked me to preach, and so um, I had done zero preparation. I didn't have a text. I didn't have a topic. I didn't have anything. Um, and so I came up to, I came up here to the podium with literally nothing to say. And as it was time for me to preach, I was still battling in my mind. Do I just want to just? flip open the Bible and just point somewhere and then just try my hardest to preach from that? Or if I wanted to take a text that Mark had preached on the previous week, which oddly enough in the dream wasn't from Ephesians, it was from somewhere else, and thinking maybe I can preach the same thing and use enough different words and phrases where it would seem like a different... Uh, and, and the thing is, in, this, in the dream, Mark, for some reason, he, you know, it was, it was good, I guess, but I mean, he... That Sunday, it was, that Sunday he decided to bring hordes of people in that he knew, and he invited them to church. So instead of looking like a fool in front of a small group of people, he brought all these people in, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to look like a bumbling goof in front of everybody here. So it has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm going to preach on this morning. I just, <laughs> just thought it'd be fun to share that. That was a, a bad dream, bordering on a nightmare. I, and I imagine uh, if I, that ever became a reality. I now, I now know the feeling of that just based on, because that didn't feel good, just being up here and not knowing exactly what to say. And uh, uh, yeah, so I prepared for this one though. So um, let not your heart be troubled. Um, I'm going to be uh, preaching from John chapter 21. So um, if, you want, if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, uh, you can. Here's the reality though. I'm it's gonna, I'm, there's going to be a lot of work, maybe not a lot of work, but a little bit of a significant uh, um, work that we need to do to get to this point of what we're, what we're looking at here um, in verses uh, 15 through, through 19 of that chapter. I've entitled this uh, the sermon, the restoring, uh, the restoring Work of Jesus. If you, if you know what's in uh, um, that passage of John 21, you know that this is the, the passage where, uh, where Peter is asked by the Lord three times, do you love me? And um, um, if we're familiar with scripture, if we're familiar with the gospels, we understand the, uh, some of the things that Peter went through coming up to this point, namely uh, the whole thing of him denying Jesus three times. And um, really to get to this point of what I want to unpack um, from this passage, I want to do as best as I can um, to just kind of review some of the things that have that have gone on up to this point, even the several verses um, of uh, chapter 21, verses 1 through uh, 14, because there's uh, some significant things in there as well um, that'll be useful for us to understand. Um, and I, as best as I want to do, as best as we can, what I want to do is I want to try and put, have all of you put yourself in, in Peter's sandals. Um, you know, it, Peter is, uh, uh, I think... I think you would agree with me that that Peter is an interesting specimen. 
Um, but uh, he's, he's not unique uh, just in the sense of uh, an, a disciple or an apostle who had his, his issues. I mean, really, if you really want to get down to it, I'm sure that all 12, um, or even at this point, all 11, uh, had their issues. And even with some of the more well-known disciples, there's something about them that we know about them. Uh, James and John were nicknamed Boagernus, which means uh, sons of thunder. And you get this idea that these are people who are very rough and, and, uh, and you know, just ready to get people. I think that that's based mostly on um, his, their whole thing of asking Jesus, uh, Jesus if, they, if he, they could call fire down from heaven on the Samaritans when they wouldn't let them through their town. Um, you think about Thomas, what's he known as? He, he's known as Doubting Thomas. Now, I'm sure that Thomas was a was a great guy, and I'm sure he was a great disciple, but there's that one thing that sticks out on his record that he's, that he's best known for, um, unfortunately for him, and that's the whole thing of, of him uh, doubting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And with Peter, I mean, you can use, you can use a handful of examples here and there to, to, uh, to highlight his weaknesses, but the one thing, I think, that comes up on his record, if you were to ask what is, what is the one fault that Peter is most known for, I think many people would say uh, he's best known, as far as his faults go, um, he's best known for his denial of Jesus three times. And um, when you really look at the biblical text, when you look at uh, things leading up to this point, it's really, it, it's really an interesting study just when you consider um, everything that's going on. And uh, I want to take us here just through stages um, of where Peter was at um, before the denial, at the denial, and then even after the denial. And so that's, that's kind of the, the framework that we're going to use as we look at this whole thing. So to start off, and again, all of this is, is our way of working our way to um, um, chapter 21, verse 15. Let's consider a little bit just what goes on before the denial. Because if we know the story from the Gospels, we understand that Peter was a very confident person maybe borderline cocky, maybe. Um, if you remember the scene, um, this wasn't so much in the upper room because most of the gospel accounts have uh, um, Peter saying what he says when they leave and they go to the Mount of Olives. But um, if, you look, if you were to look at Matthew chapter 26 and um, in verse 30, again, the, the setting of this um, is, in, is on the Mount of Olives. So they've already had uh, they're gathering in the upper room. Um, they've already celebrated the, the Passover and everything. And, um, and so now they're, Jesus is with them um, on the Mount of Olives. And uh, in verse 30, starting in verse 30 of Matthew 26, um, it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will, go before, uh, I will go before you to Galilee. So just taking that right there, let's just observe, first of all, that Peter isn't, isn't pointed out or, or called out for anything here. Because Jesus says, in reality, all of you are going to fall away. And when you read further, you see that that's what actually happens. Uh, when, the, when the Jews and the, and the, and the Roman cohort and everybody, and everybody, they come and they arrest Jesus, uh, the, the disciples run away. They scatter every which way. Um, granted, uh, Peter and John, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, as, as John calls himself um, in the book of John, they follow um, afterwards to kind of see what's going on, but um, everybody else scatters. It's a very intimidating situation. They've grabbed their Lord, they've grabbed their Savior, and, uh, and not one of them is, is willing to stick around. So he says, this is going to be something that's true of all of you. And so here comes Peter in verse, uh, in verse 33 where he says, or it says, Peter answered him, though, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. You know, so Peter was, was very confident. I don't think Peter was insincere in, in, what, he, in what he was saying, and I think he truly believed that, that when the time came, when danger arose, he, he would be able to stand firm next to his Lord you know, and say, if, if you take him, you're going to have to take me. If you, if you put him to death, you're going to have to put me to death, too. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Peter had the confidence within himself where, you know, he said, where he thought, when the time came, I am definitely going to be one who stands by my Lord, and I'm going to be one uh, who, who willingly goes to prison um, alongside of him. But you notice here, 
Um, it, it's, it's just interesting. Did you notice how the words were phrased here, what Peter said there in verse 33? Though, all, though they all fall away because of you, I never will fall away. So he's, com- he's play- playing the comparison game. And he's saying, you know, these, these guys, they might run away. That might be, that might be part of their shtick. But uh, me, I, I will never. And notice he says never. I think Matthew is the, is the only uh, gospel here where that, where that term never is used. I mean, in other places he says, I will not fall away. But Matthew, um, who, would be, who was a witness to this because he was there, you know, catalogs the whole thing where Peter says, I will never fall away. Everybody else, all these guys <laughs> might, might do that. They'll all fall away. I, I never will. Now, it's interesting. When you, look at the, when you look at the Greek text, Peter emphasizes himself in here because the way the Greek language is structured, you don't have to have personal pronouns in order to know if it's first person, second person, or whatever. Um, it's built into the language. But when a personal pronoun is used, it's usually used for emphasis. That personal pronoun is in there. So Peter's saying, I will never fall away. These guys maybe, but me, I will never, ever fall away. So if you want to talk about somebody who has confidence in his ability to stand firm, here's a good example of it right here. And, you know, we might look at something like this, and we might think, we, the, the, understanding what happens with Peter thereafter, we might have the temptation of thinking that, you know, it's probably a good idea not to have such say such things confidently because it may not be true. And, you know, maybe that's the case for some people, but at the same time, I think about the Apostle Paul, who would really say some things along the same lines. I'm in teaching in the podcast through the book of Acts. I'm coming up on Acts uh, 21, um, where uh, Paul says, uh, he says, I'm, not, I'm ready not only to be imprisoned in Jerusalem, but I'm willing to die as well. And you know what? When I read that text, I believe him. Because when it came to suffering and, and, and death, I mean, he, it, everything did follow through, and he didn't shrink back. So for some people, they can say that confidently and it be true. But I think with Peter, the case with him is that he was not drawing from spiritual resources. And so he thought that he could stand firm on his own and where he could confidently say, compared to everybody else, I will never fall away. And so in, um, in verse 34... It says, Jesus, Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So there's the prediction there that we're all, that we're all too familiar with. But look at how Peter one-ups things here. Before he says, I, I, he says, I will never fall away. And then in verse, uh, in verse 35, he says, it says, Peter said to him, even if, even, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then everybody else, as it says there, the disciples said the same. So everybody else chimed in. So, I, you know, just looking at that, at that passage in particular, it's just kind of interesting how that folds out, uh, how that unfolds. The, the confidence of Peter and the confidence of Peter compared to everybody else. And, that's, and really when you think about uh, the whole life of the disciples as they're following Jesus throughout this ministry, it's really not surprising that Peter would, would, would say something like that. I, I would be one to say if Peter wasn't so impulsive with his words and somebody else were to speak up, I think somebody else within that group would have easily said the same thing. Um, you have to understand that these are people who on more than one occasion, when they're walking with Jesus, had arguments among themselves about who's the greatest. Now, of course, Peter obviously would have been among that group arguing about who's the greatest and making a case for himself, saying that I am the greatest. So if he thinks that he's the greatest, then it's not surprising that he would think, compared to everybody else, I would probably be the one who would be able to stand firm in the face of danger if somebody comes after, if somebody comes after Jesus. So that's kind, of the, that's kind of the setup that you have. You have, the, you have this overconfidence of, of, of Peter, and we... And, when, us knowing the story from beginning to end, we do know that it's overconfidence because we know that Peter doesn't follow through with what happens. Now, the soldiers come, the Jews come, his enemies come, they carry Jesus away, everybody scatters. But again, if you know the story, if you know what Scripture says, um, you have Peter who later on just comes alongside and, and according to John, uh, comes with John. John has to do a little bit of talking to, uh, to, some, to some people, the servant girl and, and some other people to get Peter to be able to come into the courtyard uh, so, they, so that they're following with, with Jesus so that they can see exactly what, what happens, what, what's going on. And so here we come into the situation where the denial actually happens, okay? And so 
If you're familiar with this story, you know, Peter is, uh, is by a fire. He's warming himself. And it's, it's very interesting how the, how, the, how the situation just kind of expands. You know, for, it, 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 when this first started, it just started with one servant girl. Just, just one servant girl. And, and, you know, just from historical thinkings, you know, and, and historical uh, speculations, this what, probably wasn't somebody who was too old of a person. We're talking a very young girl, maybe a teenager. But there's a servant girl of some kind who comes up and, and, and recognizes Peter. It's, it's just interesting. interesting. Peter's in public. He must have thought that he wasn't going to be recognized by anybody um, that, was, that was there. But you have this one servant girl who says, hey, wait a minute. Don't I know you from somewhere? I think I've seen you with that Jesus guy. And without, without much thought, without much hesitation, he says, I don't know that, I don't know that guy. It starts out with one servant girl. And then the servant girl starts to spread word. And then before you know it, a few other people say, yeah, I think we did see you with that, with that guy. And he's like, no, no, I did. And he starts, he starts taking oaths. He, starts, he calls a curse upon himself. You know, says, I, I swear to you, I do not know who this man is. I've never seen him before. I've never talked to him before or anything like that. And then finally, before you know it, you have, you have a, a bunch of people who are saying, well, surely you must be with that guy because you're a Galilean. And, and pretty much what they're saying is we can tell who you are by your accent. Uh, you know, you must have been from Galilee and been with him in Galilee, just like he's from Galilee. And, uh, and so he says, I do not know him. Now, remember, in other parts of Scripture, when, and, and just what we, what we saw here, when Jesus makes his prediction, remember what he said. He says, when the rooster crows, uh, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So there's, a, there's three denials there, and then the rooster crows. Now, it's very interesting how Luke describes this here. You don't have to turn there. I'll just, just mention it to you. But in Luke chapter 22, verse 61, um, it's a very uh, interesting description that's uh, unique um, from all, the other, from all the other descriptions. It says that as soon as the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked at him. I just think, man, what, I mean, we know that Peter is crushed because it says that, that Peter ran away and he wept bitterly. I always wonder in that scene at that time, what was the facial expression of Jesus? I mean, they were in the courtyard. It must have been somewhere where Jesus was passing by or somewhere where he was in view, obviously. And as soon as that rooster crows, Jesus turns and looks straight at him. I can't even imagine, uh, I mean, what that's like. I, I mean, the scripture kind of describes, you know, the feelings of Peter. But even so, I don't think words do enough justice, it seems like. You kind of get the sense that Peter has this, this inner feeling in his, in his heart that, man, I, I messed up big time. And not only did I mess up big time, I, I let him down. I let him down. I let and. If you know anything about Peter, Peter, Peter really did have great, 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 great admiration for the Lord. And uh, for somebody who was as close to Jesus as he was, and to be in that position to have denied him three times, when you had so confidently said, I'm ready to die for you, and then to fall like that. I mean, really, it, it, it highlighted all the more in his own eyes, his own weakness, it didn't take much. All it, would, all it took was from, at first, one servant girl said, you know him. He said, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't know him at all. And then to have the Lord look at you after that third time, uh, it was truly crushing. And so we know that because in all the accounts, it says that Peter went away and he wept bitterly. Now, in Peter's mind, I guess one way, I guess to add insult to injury, I guess in his mind, um, you might imagine that after everything was all said and done regarding Jesus' crucifixion, um, Peter at that point was really at a low point because I don't think Peter really had much of an understanding of the whole thing that Jesus was going to rise in three days, even though Jesus had told him and the other disciples more than once. I think their mind was whole, all set on, he, he keeps saying he's going to be handed over to the chief priests, teachers of the law, and the Gentiles, and, he, and they're going to crucify him. That's what their mind was focused on constantly. But even though Jesus said, I'm going to rise in three days, I don't think that, that was where their, their thoughts were. They, they didn't focus so much on that point. Because when Jesus rises from the dead, they're all so surprised, as if he didn't say anything at all. So if we take that, we understand that, that Peter has just done something to, in his mind, really 
disappoint his Lord. And when he did that third denial and the rooster crowed, he made eye contact with him. And now, going forward, Jesus is dead. And if, we're, if we run on the assumption that Peter isn't so much thinking about the words of, of Jesus where he says that, uh, that he's going to rise in three days, Peter is thinking, that's it. When I last saw Jesus on this earth, he looked right at me after I denied him three times. And that's, gonna, that, that's tough to deal with. Even if we're talking about... If, yeah, I don't know if you, if you yourselves or maybe somebody, you know of somebody who uh, had a, um, maybe a relationship issue of some sort. And uh, somebody, one of those two parties passed away before they're able to settle accounts. You know, that's hard. That's hard. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I would imagine that in some sense, maybe Peter felt the same way. But... Uh, of course, we know the story about what happened with Jesus. He was crucified, but then he was raised again. And so it's interesting that when, um, when Jesus um, makes himself known to the women who go to the, who go to the tomb, um, one of the things that he says, says something very interesting in Mark 16 um, and in verse 7, where he says, where this is the angel talking to the woman. He says, but go... Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Isn't that interesting? He, said, he, didn't, he didn't just say, he didn't say, but go tell his disciples that he is going, to, yeah, that he's going ahead, of him, uh, ahead of you to Galilee. He could have said that, and that would have been a, a true statement, and there would have been nothing wrong with him saying that. But it's just interesting that he says, but go and tell the disciples and Peter. And I believe that, that the angel emphasizes that because Peter is at a spot right now where he feels like he's at his lowest. And so the Lord wants him to know that I'm coming after you. Now, I don't, I don't think that, I don't know if uh, Peter really picked up on that right away. Um, but uh, I think that that was the Lord's intent. And really that was the Lord's intent with all of the disciples, really. Um, if you remember what, what we looked at in that passage in Matthew where he says that you will all fall away. He said in that, in that passage too that, you know, I'm, he said, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. So even though everybody fell away, he's still going to be coming back to them. And so I just think it's very interesting where, how Jesus has this uh, his shepherding, pursuing sort of way about him as he goes back to his disciples after they all fall away and then specifically with Peter where Peter himself specifically after his overconfidence denies Jesus three times. And so um, when you get to John, and I think now we're just going to house ourselves here um, in John here for the most part. When you look at, and we look at John, um, the previous chapter in chapter 20, we know that there are two appearances that Jesus already makes to the disciples. He makes one in, uh, in chapter 20, verses 19 through 23, and that's, a, that's an encounter that the disciples have when Thomas is not there. I don't know what he was doing. He was shopping. He was eating. I don't know what he was doing. But he wasn't there. And Jesus came to them and interacted with them. So he appeared to them once. Then in verse, uh, verse 24, through, 24 through 29, he appears to them a second time. This time when Thomas was there. And there we get the whole thing about you know, Thomas saying, unless I see the nail marks, whatever, I will never... I will never believe. That's where we get the whole Doubting Thomas thing. So you have that encounter. Now when you get into chapter 21, we get to what John later on in the passage uh, identifies as the third encounter that they have with the risen Lord. Now I don't know what's going on through Peter's mind throughout this whole, throughout this whole thing um, or what kind of interaction he and Jesus had specifically. But I would imagine, and I... And I say I imagine, you know, just based on some things that, that you draw from the text, um, that Peter's confidence isn't so great anymore, especially as it relates to his level of love for the Savior. We'll get to that in a, in a little bit. Um, and along with that, perhaps his doubt of his effectiveness as a leader, both of everybody around him and what the Lord might have him do further down the road. Um, and we get that sense um, when we see here in, in chapter 21 where Peter decides to go fishing, okay? Now, this encounter with Jesus is uh, different from the other two. The other two 
appearances that Jesus made is while they were in Judea. We fast forward a little bit because now we're, we're in a scene where we're in Galilee. And that's where Jesus says he's going to go ahead of them and he's going to meet them in Galilee. And so while they're there in Galilee, they're, they're out there by the Sea of Tiberias, which is another, way of, uh, another name for the Sea of Galilee. Very familiar body of water. Peter fished there countless times. And so Peter has this idea of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go fishing. And then you have other people, they're named there, um, uh, they're named there, the disciples that went with them. They said, they decided, we're going to go with you. And so what we need to understand, though, about this is that this isn't just, I don't believe anyway, I don't believe that this is some sort of um, just random thing where just on that day, just as a leisure activity, I'm just going to go fishing like we would do. Well, I'm going to go out to this lake and we're just going to cast our rods out there and, and, and catch some fish. I think Peter is dabbling a little bit in this whole idea of leaving a life of ministry and going back to his old profession. Um, you know, he was a fisherman by trade, so were many of the other disciples. And, um, you know, you kind of get the sense that, and I don't know how much time passed between their second meeting in, in Judea and this one here in Galilee. But whatever the case may be, I think we're dealing with a situation here where Peter, after everything that happened to him, uh, before Jesus' crucifixion, he's having some serious doubts. And even though he's, he's, had a, he's had his encounter with the Lord, and even though the Lord has said some encouraging things, um, you know, even in the first encounter, he talks about them receiving the Holy Spirit and everything like that. There's just something about Peter that's just holding him back. And so he's starting to dabble, or he made the full decision, I'm not going this path anymore. I'm going full throttle back into fishing. Whatever the case may be, it's not the right direction that he needs to go. And he's not directly, but indirectly, he's, he's dragging other people with him. I think that gives you a little bit of an understanding of the influence that Peter has. Where Peter goes, I would like to go too. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. You have all these other people saying, we're going to go with you. And so, um, and so they go out and they decide to go fishing. Now, I'm going to take you back in time, both scripturally and here in our time when I, when I preached um, Gosh, I don't know how long ago it was. Um, but if you remember, um, I preached a sermon on Luke chapter 5. You remember that? Anybody remember that? When we, uh, when we looked at the, uh, the miraculous catch of fish uh, for, for Peter in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. Here in John chapter 21, we see another situation that's very, very, very similar to that. And I don't think that's an accident. It's very interesting if you just, if you just line up those those stories side by side. Um, and, you know, it's just interesting what you see going on there. With Peter in Luke chapter 5, um, after the miraculous catch of fish, you know, he, his response was to fall at his knees before Jesus and say, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And then Jesus says, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And it's interesting, he says, from now, remember, I pointed this out, I said, from now on, you will be catching men. So Jesus authoritatively made a career, a career change for Peter. Fishing was all that he knew. And, and Jesus says, you're coming out of that now. From now on, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be catching men. So now you have this situation in John chapter 21 where, where Peter is going back. And so here we have this other encounter where, where Jesus performs a, a miracle very similarly and I think he wants the disciples, and particularly Peter, to recognize it. And it would be recognizable because miraculous catches of fish in this manner isn't, isn't something that's usual. It's not part of the norm. So they're out there fishing, and they're fishing, uh, you know, the same as in Luke 5. They fish all night, and they're not able to catch anything. That's not an accident either. The Lord situated it so it would be that way. And so when you get into verse 4 and following, it says... Um, it says, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They, did, they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were, they were, not, able to haul, they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish that the that, that disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, John recognized this right away. 
He saw, because remember, John, was, uh, John the, that's who is referred to here as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John was at the scene in, in Luke chapter 5 as well. He understood. He recognized what's going on. And he said, look, it's the Lord. And you, and you notice uh, Peter's response. It says, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for, he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. And you get the idea that he jumps in and he swims um, in excitement. Now, even though maybe his confidence is shattered, I think maybe he might be glad to see the Lord because maybe there had been a, a, t a time distance between that second appearance and that third appearance. And maybe giving t Peter some time to think a little bit, and just thinking, you know, is the Lord going to have anything, to, anything more to do with us? Is he going to have anything more to do with me especially? There you have the Lord out on the shore and Peter jumps in. And swims, and it says uh, in verse eight, the other disciples came and it came in uh, the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Okay, so they see and they recognize that it's the Lord. They have a, a miraculous, um, they have a miraculous catch of fish um, that has happened, very similar to what you see. In Luke 5, John recognizes it, and, and I would imagine so would, so would Peter. So, in verses 9 through following, it's very interesting that, here's how we can, we can look at this. I was looking at this the other day, and I was thinking this is so interesting how this is laid out. I believe that that catch of fish was a, was a, was a miracle for recognition purposes only. It wasn't so that, hey, uh, you can catch fish and so that when you drag them on shore, we can, we can have breakfast, we can use those fish, we can, we can fillet them and, and everything, and, and we can have some stuff to eat. Um, they would have more than enough to eat, but you know, it, it wasn't about that. Because when they come on shore, when you, lead, when you read the following passages, Jesus already has fish cooking when they come on shore. He's already, he's already cooking breakfast. So it's just interesting how, how, that, how that's put together, which gives you this understanding that there's more to this whole, this, this whole miraculous catch of fish um, than meets the eye here. Um, you know, there's, so there's that observation. There's the observation that you see of, of, the, of, the, of the nets not tearing here in, in John chapter 21. Um, it says that, let me point that out here. That's... Um, do, 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 um, and although they were, there were so many, the, nets, the net was not torn. That's in verse 11. Um, unlike what you see in Luke chapter 5, where it says that the, that the nets were breaking. And I don't know if there's too deep a significance in there or not. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. If there is, maybe that's just, that's just, uh, uh, you know, just showing a heightened form of the miracle that would speak in a significant way to the disciples. But you have all these different things going on that are, that are, very, uh, that are very noteworthy. But here's the most noteworthy part of, this, uh, of it all, I think, in this area right before we get to our passage here in verse 15. Um, it says, um, let's see, they, um, they knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish... Um, this was now the third time that Jesus was, uh, was revealed to the disciples after he, uh, after he was raised from the dead. Um, I'm sorry, this was before then, I'm sorry. Um, it said, I'm sorry, verse 9 actually is where it is. Where it says, uh, when they came on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Now I want to underline the whole, the whole thing of charcoal fire. This was on a charcoal fire. Now, John has a tendency to do this. He tends to write things in a very subtle way that if you read past it quickly, you might miss it, um, which kind of provides some interpretive challenges to you know, what you're dealing with here. Um, but it's interesting. I think that this is a setup. The, the whole thing where Jesus is, is cooking fish on a charcoal fire is a setup for what he's about to do in reinstating Peter. You think about what happens there in the passage that we're going to see that we're going to see here. Jesus asks Peter three times, "Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me?" Before, when he denied, when, when Peter denied the Lord, where was he? He was in front of a charcoal fire, a charcoal fire, and before that fire, he denied the Lord three times. So I think that this is this is all pointing to a setup where Jesus is going to restore Peter, somebody who's, whose confidence is shattered, shattered so much to the point that he doesn't really feel like he's in a position to go out and minister for the Lord at all. He's going to go back fishing. 
And so the scene is set, and so now we come here to our passage in verses, in verses 15 through 19. And let me just read it here, and then, we'll, and then we'll make some observations here. So in chapter 21, verse 15, it says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So very interesting thing here. And the, and the thing that makes this passage interesting it's how, we, is, is, how the, is how it's laid out in the original language. Here in English, we, we have this whole thing where it says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, you know I love you. Do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. But in the original language, there are two words for love that it's used here. Now, a lot of people put some meaning behind it, and then there's some people who say, like, well, he's just using it interchangeably. But it's interesting that he uses these two different words. Um, when Jesus asks, um, at least the first two times, Peter, do you love me? He uses the word agape. And the word agape is a, is a very strong love word. Um, it signals deep devotion um, and dedication to somebody. Um, it's the strongest word that, uh, that you could use for love uh, in the Greek language um, that John felt necessary to use when he wrote this. Um, so Jesus asks well, he has, he has a couple of things that you can notice here. He says, number one, the word that he uses there, do you love me? It's the agape kind. And he says in the, fir in the first question, do you love me more than these? Now, what's the more than these? Now, I've heard a couple of, a couple of suggestions as to what that is, either, either more than these disciples or more than these nets and these fish. Going back to uh, your old profession, do you love me more than your profession or do you love me more than these disciples? Um, you know, I'm one who, I'm, I don't have to go into a, a, a several minutes of explanation as to why maybe, I guess, but I, I lean more towards the idea that Jesus is asking him, do you love me more than these disciples? Just based on how Peter carried himself along when he, when he stood up in overconfidence. Though all might fall away, I won't. So he's kind of setting himself up as, as, you know, in an indirect way saying, I think I love the Lord more than these guys. So much to the point, I, my love is so strong for you that, that I will stand by your side and everybody else, their love is fickle and they'll, and they'll fall away. They might, but I won't. And so I think that's what Jesus was getting at. Do you love me more than these? And so he said to, and he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, a couple of th observations there. He said, all he said was, yes, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. The, the more than these things, he drops off because I think he knows that you know, he was in the same boat with everybody else. He didn't stick out um, as the one who, who loved Jesus more than everybody else. He was along with everybody else when they ran away. Um, and his uh, weakness, so to speak, was magnified in, this, in his denial of the Lord three times. So he's just content of saying, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, Jesus said, do you love me more than, you, more than these? Do you agape me? The way that Peter responds he says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. That's the word that he uses, which I think is a riot given the fact that they just got done eating fish, phileo. You know, it's, it's just an interesting, it has nothing to do with fish. It has everything to do with love, but it's just, it's just interesting how that's, how that's pointed out. But that's, that's the word that's used. And that's, that's kind of a lesser form. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good word. Phileo is a good word. Um, but it, it, it speaks more of a, a, of a brotherly love, a brotherly bond, but it's not at the same level of an agape, okay? So I think the one thing that you can say about Peter is that, you know, Peter's being honest at least. 
And so when Jesus says, do you agape me? Do you, do you really love me, Peter? Peter's saying, I, I, think you're, I think you're all right. I think you're cool. You know, maybe along those lines, something of a lesser form. You know, I was thinking about this. I was just kind of thinking uh, along the lines of a guy. If he likes a guy, he's been going out with a girl for a while, and he decides to throw that I love you out there. And she says, I think you're okay, too. Ooh, you know, that's not exactly what he was, what, what he was expecting. Now, it, it, different from that scenario, I think Jesus knew where Peter was and wasn't surprised by the fact that Peter said, yes, Lord, I, I, I phileo you. I, I, I'm fond of you. I think, I think you're okay. How could, he, how could he say otherwise, just given what had happened not too long before, where he denied, where he denied Jesus three times? But then you notice the response. This is still in uh, verse 15 at the very end. Um, he, Jesus, said to him, feed my lambs. Now, that's, to me anyway, to me, that's just a very interesting response. Um, it's not, I mean, Peter acknowledges his, that his love for the Lord is not where it needs to be. I think that's his confession that he's making to the Lord. And even with that, though, the Lord says, feed my lambs. There wasn't anything that Jesus said where he said, you know what, we're going to put you on a, we're going to have you do ministry on a probationary uh, basis. Or Jesus didn't say, you know what, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know about you, Peter. Um, yeah, I don't know if you're, if you're very useful to me. Um, he just straight out says, feed my lambs. Oh, wow feed my lambs. The whole thing, the whole thing of feeding, and, and, and you'll see, as you'll see later in the, in the second uh, question, uh, it says, tend my, tend my sheep. Um, so there's a, there's a progression there where feed the lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. These are, these are uh, directives from the Lord telling Peter, go out and take care of, and take care of my sheep. F feed my lambs. So you, you have the situation where Peter is, um, is recommissioned in that leadership role. Um, which I don't know how, how Peter would have internally received that because you think about somebody in his position who put himself up as a leader and somebody who was supposed to serve as an example. It just seems like, you know, I failed you in the worst way. I'm admitting to you I'm not agapeing you. I'm phileoing you. And yet Jesus says, feed my lambs. And I think that's amazing. I think that there's a reason why Jesus is able to say, is, is able to go in there and say, feed my lambs, even though you feel, even though you know and you acknowledge that your love for me isn't where it needs to be. So that's verse 15. And then you go on to verse 16 and you have, this, you have the same thing. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Again, that's, that's the construction there in the original. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I fillet owe you. So again, it's just a repeat of, of what's going on there. And keep in mind, this is, this is in front of everybody. This, there, you don't get the, the, the sense from the text that Jesus has pulled them aside and they're having a private conversation. They've all eaten breakfast. And the way that I see it is that this is happening with, with everybody else around them. So it's, you know, it's very interesting that everybody else is witnessing this as well. And I think and if that's the case, I think it's very important that people see this as well. Um, uh, that this whole thing going out as Jesus is, is reinstating Peter in, this, in the ministry here. So you have that whole repeat, the, 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 the back and forth between agape and phileo. But then you get to verse 17. It says, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? He doesn't say agape. He changes the word, Jesus does in this third question. He doesn't say agape anymore. He comes down and uses Peter's word. He says, Peter, are you, are you fond of me? And it's, as it says there, as it goes on, it says Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you, do you love me or do you phileo me? And um, for the longest time when I, when I read this passage, I thought that I, I, the way that I saw this is that Peter was grieved because Jesus felt the need to ask him three times. It was the repetitiveness of the, of, the, of the questioning that really grieved Peter. So when it came to the third time, Peter was, was grieved. And maybe, maybe that explains some of it. I don't want to totally dismiss that. But I think that really, again, what you have is it, what really speaks to this whole thing is the change of the word. 
The third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me? And so it says, it says that Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? That's, again, that's, that's the word that's used there. He was grieved because, he said, because on that third time he said, do you phileo me? I think that that's what really gets him. So I think the way that Peter is really receiving this whole thing is that Jesus is now starting to question even that lower level of devotion, even that lower level of, of, of brotherly love. It's almost as if Peter's receiving this and he's saying, and, and Jesus is saying, do you really? Help me? Oh man, ouch! I, I I know I know I messed up, but man, I, I you know it's you know all he could say he, he could repeat himself uh, again and by answering the question that uh, by answering the question in the affirmative. But it's interesting in that third answer that Peter gives, and this is in the middle of that verse there, um, and he says, and he said to him, Lord, you know everything. All he could do is, is appeal to the Lord's omniscience as it relates to this whole thing. And Peter understood, Lord, you know everything. You know all things as it relates to this matter. You know that I love you. You know that, you know that this is the case. So he appeals to the, Lord, to, to, to the Lord's omniscience in order for him to read his sincerity with that. And again, like I said, i got to admire Peter at this point. Because he's being honest. And he's saying... I phileo you, I don't agape you, which you get the sense that Peter's saying that I know my love for you isn't where it needs to be. But even after that third time, and even after that third answer, it says there, Jesus said to him, um, feed my sheep. So there you see the whole thing is, is complete. You have, the, you have the, the three questions, you have the three answers, Peter being honest about it, saying... I'm not where I need to be. And I just want you to think about that for a little bit. Because that's the whole thing of Peter recognizing that he's not exactly where he needs to be, that his love, his devotion isn't necessarily where it needs to be, is something that maybe we can all identify with. Um, I'm sure that you feel that there have been days, weeks, months where you just feel off. I mean, the, the, the explanations, the reasons can be various, but have you ever been at that point where you know that in this particular point in your walk with Christ, at this moment, you are not where you need to be. And actually, you might feel miles apart just based on anything that, that's going on in your life that, uh, that day. Um, by your speech, your vocabulary, the things that you do, your attitudes, your thought life, you know, all sorts of things. And you're very much well aware of them. And then you think, with all of this that's going on in my mind and in my thoughts and my, in my actions... I know I'm not where I need to be. What sort of use can I be to the Lord right now? And the temptation can be to shrink back. And we might think, well, okay, I need to get things together uh, before I can do anything else for the Lord. Or I, can, I need to do this, A, B, C, or D, before I can talk to these people. Or, um, you know, for, you know, for my particular situation, my particular context, I might need to do this, this, and this before I feel the need where I'm ready to preach another sermon again or something. Um, our usefulness uh, might feel, you know, we might not feel as useful. And I think that that's how Peter felt. And he acknowledged, I'm not where I need to be, but yet God was one who said, feed my sheep. Now, it's very interesting what you see going on in verse 18. Look at, look at the jump that's made here by the Lord here. In verse 18, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you, were, but when you are old, you will, stretch out your, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And then, and then John gives a little bit of a, of a parenthetical commentary on what he says there. It says, This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Now, isn't that interesting? We're dealing with Peter, who had just denied the Lord for three times, and here Jesus is saying that there's going to come a time where you will stand firm, and you will die for my sake. If you're familiar with the historical tradition, the tradition is that during the Neronian persecution, uh, Peter was crucified, and he was crucified upside down. So the whole, the whole thing of stretching out your hands and, and things like that is a euphemism for, uh, for crucifixion. So we've seen Peter where he was before, and now we see what the Lord predicts of him later on. And so you understand that there's, that there's 
something of a shift. At least the Lord sees it that way. And so the, the, Peter is going to have that opportunity where his love for the Lord is going to be expressed in, in the highest form. And that's in the way where, where Peter willingly gives up his life for the Lord. And so much to the point that if the tradition is true, he didn't see himself as worthy enough to be crucified in the same way as the Lord. And so he's crucified upside down. And so what we see here, if we want to talk about the restorative work of Jesus, and we're using this whole thing of Peter as this visual aid for us, this example, I think what we, what we, can, what we can gather from here, what we can draw from this, is that Peter, that God was one who was going to be working in Peter's life this whole time, all right? And part of, and part of that whole thing is going to require something of Peter, and you see that in the latter part of verse 19. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. If, we wanna, if, if Peter is not where he wants to be, and the Lord's saying, this is where you're going to be, you know, the one, the, the one thing that you need to do, first of all, is follow me. You don't shrink back. You don't go back to your profession. You do what I told you before. Remember, Jesus made a career change back in Luke chapter 5. From now on, you will be catching men. So Jesus says, follow me. That's the first step, right? That's the first step for Peter. That's the first step for us as well. Follow me. And so that's, and so that's what he does. Now, he has a question about what, if this is going to be the same as uh, for John, and we don't need to, to get into that, that part of the text. But I just want us to focus on this, uh, on this whole thing of, of, of what's going on with, uh, with Jesus and Peter. And you'll notice there, it it's, isn't it interesting, it says... Um, that parenthetical note, this, is, this he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. I don't know if we often consider death for the sake of Christ as something that glorifies God. You may think of, oh, that's terrible. And it is terrible from a human point of view. I'm not saying that, that it's good that people kill other people for the faith or anything like that. But it's just interesting that this, that this is something where God is glorified in the death of his servants. And even here, specifically as it, as it relates to Peter, this is something where when the time comes, when Peter is, is, has that opportunity to give his life for the Lord, it's a death that glorifies God. You ever wonder why that is, why, why something like that is pegged as something that glorifies God? Well, just think about it. Whether you're talking about Peter specifically here or whether you're reading a specific, a specific story about any particular martyr, and there's been many, many of them, um, Many people who have been put in a position to uh, deny Christ or be tortured, deny Christ or die. When you have people who stand firm in the toughest of times, and you especially see this in the, in the early parts of church history, um, and people will not yield. What's being demonstrated there is somebody, is somebody who recognizes the high value of Christ in their life, so much to the point where they will not let Christ go. And that says, that says something pretty significant to, uh, to people who are persecuting them at that time. That's why I think that in some cases, and I read stories about this, where you have people who are viciously persecuted for their faith, and they still, can, and they still hang on to that faith. And as a result, that because of the testimony of what that, what that says to the persecutors, you actually have some persecutors who turn to the Lord. That happens. That happens sometimes. And I think that the reason is they, they, they understand and they recognize that with this particular person, what they're saying is, I love the Lord so much and I hold him in such high esteem that there is no way in the world, no way in the world that I'm going to deny him, that I'm going to, uh, that I'm going to uh, uh, um, reject him or, or anything of that nature. And so that magnif that's a testimony to who God is in that person's life. And therefore, that is, a, that is a death that glorifies God. And so that's why, you know, I'm pretty sure you've heard of the, um, the saying that the blood of the saints is the seed of the church. It's one of the big reasons why, I would imagine. And so Peter is going to, is, is going to be in that position. So I think what, you, what we have here is that the Lord understands, the Lord the Lord has work that he's going to do in Peter's life. And I want to point you to one other thing here, and with this we'll close. And this, kinda, this is kind of what set my thoughts in motion, is just as far as um, what Jesus had planned for Peter. 
um, in his life. In Luke chapter 22, and um, we're going back here to the, um, where Jesus is about to, is about to um, predict um, Peter's denial. And right before Peter does, has, says this whole thing, I'm ready to die for you, I'm ready to do this, I'm ready to do that, you know, all these all this sorts, of, sorts of things. In Luke chapter 22 and in verse 31, it says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, you want to know real quick the interesting thing about that is verse 31, the word you in the original is plural. So he's, he's referring to everybody. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you all, in other words, if we're using the plural, you all. He's, he's demanded to have you all and to sift you like wheat. Then you get to the verse 32. But I have prayed for you, singular in the Greek. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And I just think that that's, that's amazing, the fact that Jesus is, is, was in the position where he's praying for Peter. He's that, he's that intercessor for Peter. And then he says, and when you have turned again, so Jesus already knew that, that the end of the story, Peter's going to turn. He's going to turn, and I'm going to have a specific purpose for him, because when he turns, you're now going to be in a position to strengthen your brothers. So it's all of the work of the Lord that, that the Lord does with Peter, even with Jesus praying for Peter, and then putting him in a position to strengthen his brothers. And so you see the Lord's work not only in Peter's life, but in everybody's life who, who had fallen in that weakness. And that just highlights all the more the work of God in individual lives. We might recognize, just like Peter, that we're not where we need to be. But one thing that we can do is we can count on the Lord who works with us each step of the way. And I think the one, the, the one thing that Satan does to get his grubby little hands in the whole thing is to, is to weigh us down with that doubt, to weigh us down with that, that lack of confidence. And where we, when we feel like we're not where we need to be, we say, okay, where I'm, not, where I, I'm not where I need to be, therefore I am just not going to do anything at all. Or I'm going to cut back significantly on things that the Lord has told me to do. That's the wrong move. We need to come before the Lord and we need to say, Lord, I understand I'm not where I need to be, but I know that, that you are at work in me and that you can change me to who I need to be. It's interesting. I, just as I'm talking about this, I'm thinking about, I'm just thinking about my mom. Um, I re remember times when, you know, just in her raising me and my brother, maybe she would deal, she would do things or, or deal with certain situations with me and my brother that she wasn't proud of. And I would remember that she would say, she would say, man, I'm, I'm just not where I need to be, but I know that the Lord is working with me. And I believe her, and, and, he, and, he, and he did, and he was working with her to help her along in those rough edges where she needs a little bit of improvement, transformation, and things like that. Now imagine if there was another, t uh, another way of, of, of going about this that my mother said. Um, this might sound ridiculous, but I, I'd say this just to, to give you an idea of what, what we're talking about here. If my mom had said, man, I'm just not where I need to be just as it relates to how I deal with, deal with my children here, here, and here. Um, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just not going to be a parent anymore. I'm going to give my kids up. <laughs> you know? I, you know, because I, I've truly, truly I've failed you know, here. And we're talking about minor things. I mean, I know that there are some parents who do things where the kids really do need to be taken away. But we're just talking about, you know, faults, foibles, you know, here and there. Just imagine if she, if she said that, oh, I'm, I'm just not where I need to be. I don't think I'm fit to be a parent. I'm just going to give up my kids or I'm not going to take care of them anymore. That would be ridiculous. And so in the same way, you know, we understand that we're not where, where we need to be a lot of times. And in fact, we're never going to be ultimately where we need to be until Christ comes back. But, it's, but we are always on this side of eternity a work in progress. And so following the advice of Jesus that he gave to Peter says, follow me. That's what we need to keep on doing. And allowing the Lord to intercede for us, to, to shape us, to mold us. And before you know it, you know, you know, there might be some time down the road where you kind of realize and recognize the transformation in your own self. You ever had that happen? 
you know you have struggles here and there with attitudes here and there and then down the road. So a situation comes up and you think, man alive. A few years ago, I would have done this, this, and this. That would have been sinful. But now it's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that person. I told that to, a pers- uh, to somebody I was working in ministry with. And he just smiled and said, behold the power of God in your life. And he was exactly right. He was exactly right. So let not your heart be troubled. You know, the Lord loves you enough to be able to do that for you. And he continues to shape us into his image. And so we take that as a, I take that as, a, as, a, as just an outreaching of love from his part to touch our lives, to shape us into the people that we need to be and so that we can be in a position to glorify his life. If you enjoy this program, be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. Also, follow Loving the Scriptures on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts, that's L-T-S-C-R-I-P-T-S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. God bless.